surrounding body image are complex, really complex, and they're common. In March 2019, a survey conducted by the Mental Health Foundation with YouGov of 4,505 UK adults and 1,118 teenagers found that one in five adults, that's 20%, felt shame over their body image. Just over a third felt down or low and 19% felt disgusted. Among teenagers, 37% felt upset, 31% felt ashamed. One in eight adults experienced suicidal thoughts and just over one in five adults and 40% of teenagers said that images on social media caused them to worry about their body image. There is a reason behind us starting with those stats, but that's not all either. Just last week, as we record, there was a warning that gym closures during lockdown led to a rise in people feeling insecure. According to an online poll by the Women and Equalities Committee, two thirds of under 18s and 61% of adults feel negative or very negative about their body image most of the time. This, is, this issue is serious and common, so on this podcast episode, we're going to try and pick it apart. Thanks to our partners at the Mintrish Foundation and also Kit Makers Limitless, who are helping to build a confident and active generation, we have three amazing sportswomen to help us dissect this issue which plays a part, of course, in women's sport and sport in general. So first off, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome onto the show, along with myself and Will, England international rugby players Zoe Harrison and Justine Lucas. And we also have Olympic gold and bronze medalist and former GB hockey captain Kate Richardson-Walsh. So a huge welcome to everyone. Thank you for, for joining us on this podcast. And usually we don't start as seriously as that. Um, but I, I suppose I think it's important to, to show the gravity of the issue, really, uh, and, and why we're ultimately here to talk about it. Of course, these issues all extend into sport. And I suppose my first question to really throw out to everyone is how big is the issue to you? And have you seen it play a part, really, in your sport? Uh, and I'll f start by firing off at Kate. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it still affects me now. I'm not an athlete anymore, but it still affects me now. I'm still, um, I don't know if it's because we're so kind of, what we eat was so routine and we, we've programmed in like how much to eat, what we eat, when we train. So when as an athlete, it kind of becomes um, just part and parcel of life. But I felt like as an athlete, I always felt like, what I was eating was fueling my training and fueling my body. And that's the way I kind of saw it. I, I suppose now I've finished and I'm not training as nowhere near as hard, if at all, most days and still wanting to eat that food and what impact that's having on me, my view of myself, um, how I feel about my body, how I feel about myself, how I feel about food. And particularly in lockdown, I think that's, as lots of people have found, I, I found that particularly hard. I am a comfort eater and it was, you know, I'm in two bedroom flats. So it was like a five metre walk to the fridge and, you know, just wanting to eat everything that was in there and not being able to exercise perhaps in the way I wanted to. So I've seen it impact me in that way. And I've seen it impact lots of my colleagues and teammates as I, as I competed it affects as you said so many people it's it's really common but it's something that we still don't talk about that much I don't think yeah if you look at the conversations I think there's still not quite as much as perhaps we should be having and we'll pick up on everyone's individual issues later on um but I'll first go then to Justine and, and ask sort of your own experiences with the issue as well yeah I wouldn't say like unless well I think my parents might disagree but I was always like quite big build um and I always remember like always feeling bigger than my peers like growing up and actually it probably wasn't till I started playing rugby and I started playing rugby quite late so I think I was only like 20 21 um, and I always played hockey actually and a bit of football and I just always felt like I was the big one the odd one out because I was like just naturally bigger taller wider whatever um so yeah it definitely affected me until I probably found rugby where it's a bit more 
for all shapes and sizes and, and that's when I really kind of got into actually wanting to go to the gym and and feeling a bit more proud of my body um mm. but equally it's, it's funny because I think Zoe will probably have a different experience but I'm a forward so in rugby I'm, I'm encouraged to be bigger which is like quite different from a lot of other people's experiences um, mm. and Zoe as a back might have a different experience from me so even though we play the same sport I would imagine that our experiences of, of body image and how we feel about our bodies are probably fairly different as well. And then that perfectly tees up Zoe. <laughs> yeah so um, when I was younger I remember at school I did actually get uh, I noticed myself that I was bigger than a lot of the other girls but then I was also called a few names for it um, so I was like a you know a bit sh I try to shy away from things like lifting weights and I remember just a, a year before I was going to go to Hartbury I was like you need I need to get into some S&C now and start lifting some weights if I'm going to go into a really elite environment and I remember um turning up and saying to the, the S&C guy oh don't make me lift any big weights I don't want to be muscly I remember he turned around and was like but look at Jess Ennis she looks amazing she's stunning and all of this and then I got to Hartbury and that was really in my head and I was like Jess Ennis has got so far and she's done all this training to be where she is so this is actually going to help me and it doesn't matter you know what I end up looking like it's for my sport and it's it's going to take me where I want to go um but on Justo's point is she's obviously told to like put on weight quite a lot whereas for me it's sort of getting a balance um because obviously you know as a forward you might only be on the you've got a scrummage and you know do all that heavy hitting um for me I've got to end up running around quite a lot um and being able to like keep going for 80 minutes but also have a bit of weight behind me um you know I think sometimes it's quite hard to get the balance so yeah that's what I feel. As athletes then in that professional environment and I hope you don't mind me asking this but is is there like a focus that's put on sort of how much you're weighing and how much physical shape you're in and if so sort of does that take a little bit of getting used to sort of when you first come into that environment at all? Uh, yeah. I feel um, at England just though has gone for it as well we do get tested quite a lot and one of the testing is on on your weight and then you get um either a DEXA scan or the clippers for fat testing um and that comes up quite a lot and we are told that we need to sometimes be a certain weight I know the forwards were pushed quite a lot on that um but even so for me I remember I was really quite high in my fat percentage and I was told to drop quite a lot and when it came to that, I was a bit like, oh God, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? I've been in an, in an elite environment in my college, but what am I going to do now? And I remember one of the girls turning around and saying, look, you're still really young. You're probably holding on to like some puppy fat still. I was that when I came, when I was your age, just keep going with your training and stuff and it will slowly come off. But I remember really worrying about it at the time. And well, now I have seen it, that it is coming off. Like the more training I do, the understanding about nutrition it's like it does work it does you know come off and there's there's quite a big deal isn't there made about like when you you know it's like testing camp or whatever everyone's like oh my god like i can't drink i can't eat like my, i'm getting my skin folds done and like it is a real anxiety and we just egg each other on with it as well even though we all know that we've been training hard and like looking after our nutrition but it's just an anxiety like what what if i've gone up one mil of fat which like in reality is nothing but like there is a, quite a big focus on it. And I, I remember when I first came in, it was like, you, if you were over a hundred mil of fat, you were like, you were always in like the fat club, like, oh, you're over a hundred. Like, mm. And it was really like, kind of intimidating. Um, and then like, I didn't even know what that meant when I came into the system. And as, as like Zoe said, like you'll come in like with not really much training under your belt or like not in an elite environment anyway. So of course you're going to be holding a bit of extra fat and yes, being in a professional elite environment that's what you're there for is to get fitter and faster and stronger but there definitely is like a lot of pressure put on and it does cause a lot of anxiety but it's part of sport like you you need to get that balance but it's how how we make it healthy as sports people as sports practitioners to talk about it a bit in a safe environment I think yeah I think exactly as as 
um, Justine and Zoe just said, I think I was really lucky. I had um, naturally a, um, a lean body type, so would hold not so much fat and would just be able to put on muscle relatively easily. And um, I'd have to like eat the right, I'd have to eat the right thing and train. It wasn't just like, oh, here she is. It, I had to actually do it, work hard. But um, compared to other people in the squad who, who you'd look at them and think, oh, they're tiny, they're, there's nothing on them. And then their kind of their body fat measurements. And, you know, it wasn't public. It was only, it was all individual, but of course we talked to each other. And exactly as Justine said, that we had a group who um, were doing extra training and going on specific kind of nutrition plans before London 2012. And they kind of called themselves the Fat Club. And it was, you know, it was funny and it was a bit of a joke, but there's this stigma there that's, and it's how we view our bodies and how our bodies are viewed by other people. And I think it is about creating that safe environment to be able to support people in their, because we're all different, we're all different body shapes, all different body types. We, we're all gonna view it in a different way as well. And I think it's that individual recognition, but I do think we need to be, really careful and sensitive about how we how we deal with it with each person listening to all your answers so far on this it to me it's almost like we can break it down into what you faced growing up whether you might have been the odd one out or you felt like you were the odd one out in your groups and then also the challenges of actually maintaining that body weight and or fat whatever it might be when you're actually in your career to, Speaking specifically about your elite careers, did that almost take over your mind to some extent, kind of working out what to eat when, but also maybe trying not to be in that fat club, like you say? Yeah, I th think for me, there was one point where um, I'd, I'd kind of come into the system, like Zoe said, and I probably had a bit of puppy fat and managed to manage that fairly well. And then, so I got up to whatever weight and skin fold I was meant to be. And then I got injured and I was out for about nine or 10 months. And obviously I was in on crutches for ages and like you get your muscle wasted, it just goes. And I think I lost about six kilograms. And I then remember getting my skin folds and, and weight done. And then basically setting me this target of, it, of eating 3,500 calories a day. But obviously you have to hit like the macros and stuff. And I literally remember sitting in my, in my flat like stuffing boiled eggs into my mouth oh. at like 10 o'clock at night because I just knew that I needed to get it. And that like, yeah, that consumed me for that period because I was like, I want to do that. I want to gain that weight, but like in the proper way. Um, so that that was, I really vividly actually quite remember that thinking, oh, everyone thinks eating all those calories is great, but it's actually really hard. And I just didn't eat eggs for about six months after that because I couldn't cope. But then like eventually you kind of did naturally just because that's how my, where my body felt comfortable at that point, I did get back to that weight and then it wasn't so much of an issue to maintain it. But I think when there's either a big weight gain or loss, then it does consume you. Yeah. And you've all, you've all spoken there about um, feeling the need to, to maintain a certain uh, body image for sort of your elite performance standards and, and things like that. But there was, a, some of you may have actually done this study in 2016, BT Sport did a survey about, um, female athletes and how they look and things like that and one of the statistics they found is that 80 percent of female athletes surveyed felt that after they felt had a they had a pressure to conform to a certain look and a certain body type and that wasn't necessarily just for performance but just to to look a certain way at whether that be for people watching or whether that be for sort of themselves is that something that you think is, is still an issue in sport? And is that something you've ever experienced? You feel like, oh, I've got to look this, I'm a rugby player, I'm a forward, I've got to look this way, or I'm a hockey player, I've got to look this way. Is that something that's ever affected you, any of you at all? I can't say I, I personally it's affected me, but I can see um, where it comes from. Like when I'm a rugby player and then I go into Instagram or socials and I see those girls that just gym, um, uh, who are all influencers all over Instagram and see what their body type is like. And I sit there and you can see that people do think that I go to the gym and they go to the gym. So why does my body not look like theirs? But they don't end up having to be running around for 80 minutes on a rugby pitch and be hit by girls that can be around 90 to hundred kgs. So I sit there and think, well, my body has to be completely different to theirs. Yes, we both gym, but I've got to be more robust to be able to take a lot of impact. 
Um, so I can see why that those results have come out. Yeah, this is, yeah, exactly the same. I think I never really had a problem. I mean, I when I first got into the team in the senior team in 1999, and there was like no nutritionist really, and we had a little bit of S and C. There was no no psychologist. The kind of coach was kind of doing it all. Um, and then you fast track to the end of my career when we had all of this support services and it was amazing. But, you know, even through all of that, I'd probably say towards the end of my career, there was definitely young players coming in and who felt a pressure to, to be, look and be a certain way. And, and there was a fear of doing gym and there was a, and there was a fear of what that was going to do to their body, a fear of what that looked like. Now, I think there's a real, um, there's another aspect to this I think for female athletes and it's also a little bit around sexuality because kind of traditionally as a as a female athlete if you're muscly you play sport you're a woman you're muscly you must be gay and I think that's a kind of stereotype that's still we're still kind of wrangling with I think we kind of went through the 90s um, and the kind of early 2000s when then women were kind of female athletes were over sexualized to kind of overcompensate for that. You no, know, you know, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm not muscly, I'm, I'm not gay, I'm, you know, it's, it's just breaking all of that down and just being like, we're all different, different body shapes, different body types, we look different, we play different. And, and I think that's the good thing now, we've got such a broad range of, stereo, um, of role models. Um, across different sports and that's what young girls need now I believe just all different body shapes playing sport to the very best of their ability. Um, I was just going to say um, I, I'm probably fairly different I guess from from you guys in, in terms of that question because I think again coming back to being a forward we are always pushed to be heavier so actually and our skin folds could be higher than a back and actually I probably, I was told at one point to be like 95 kilograms and I'd probably sit high 80s, like pretty comfortably. So that was a lot of weight to put on. And at that time, it like didn't necessarily need to be muscle. It was just, we just needed you to be heavy. And actually I was like sat there and I was like, I'm not, I'm not being 95 kilograms. Like I think I got up to 92 and I really didn't like stepping on the scales every day and weighing in and whatever. And I just didn't feel comfortable. So I think actually for me, it, it's probably the opposite like I, I felt I felt like I had to be heavier and didn't feel comfortable myself and actually probably probably now I'm not playing rugby I feel more comfortable in my body because I can do the training that I want to to, to look the way I want to um so yeah I think yeah that's a that's a weird one but <laughs> yeah that's my take on it but again shows how different it is at the same time too um like Kate alluded to, and obviously it, it feels like there's been some steps forward and steps and some progress made on this front, but why do we still critique women's bodies as much as we do? Because it's, it's still some, somewhere embroiled in society, whether it's on social media or whatever it might be. And clearly lots of people still feel that pressure. But what, where is that, where's that rooted in? What, what's it coming from and how do we change it? Which is a big question in itself. Let's solve it on this podcast. Come on, come on. Absolutely. I mean, it's been there for centuries, though, hasn't it? Like, if you look back to kind of, you know, Tudor times, Victorian times, there is an, there's an idea, and you go through all the decades. There's been an ideal body shape for women. Like, where, who decides that? Who comes up with that? You know, who has the power to influence? media the markets clothing design you know and it's it's so it's into it's interwoven into everything and now social media you just cannot get away from it and it's it's still there it's still it still exists um that ideal body type definitely or what we should be aspiring to be in this moment yeah um, on that as well like um what's, what's she won um celebrity get me out of here what's her name Jack Jacqueline Josser or something Jacqueline. yeah so she did an article the other the other day don't know if any of you saw it but basically she she's a size 12 to 14 but she gets called like plus size and but yet she's probably slimmer than the average woman but yet people perceive her when they see her in bikini or bra and and pants as being plus size so I think that's surely like I don't, I don't know whether that's a problem with other people's perceptions of what 
what a si what size you are um but that's that's an issue surely like we should be celebrating that and like she's a proud 12 to 14 size woman which is certainly smaller than i am so <laughs> i think also it's always changing so mm -hmm. look a few years ago and it was all everyone be really slim model type and now because instagram's really come alive and twitter and stuff like that you all the influencers are actually girls that go to the gym um so for me it's it is actually constantly changing i think um mm. it also uh, depending what sport you're in as well because rugby i can see what kate was saying is as in the gay type like people think just because you're really mus muscly you're probably bigger than some of the girls you must you must be gay or something but these like, small petite girls that go into the gym you know it's it's always for me it's always changing and it's just hard to to get to a point of you know no one really knows one thing you've mentioned there is the the use of the social social media people are you know there's there's a lot more access to see photos and videos of female athletes mm -hmm. and as the coverage of women's sport grows which is a fantastic thing there will be more coverage of you guys and more photos and videos out there as the coverage grows do you feel like that sort of affects you and how you're thinking about oh i'm going to be on tv thousands of people are going to see me i need to look this certain way does that something that either affects you or do you know if it's ever affected a, a teammate or anything like that at all for me personally i it doesn't affect me but i think it's actually really good that we're starting to get on tv more and more younger girls are seeing us are seeing all different shapes and sizes of girls and what you push on um as i said earlier you do what you need to do for your sport to get where you want to be um and i think that's really key for young girls to see so they're not just seeing this these models up on you know um out on these websites or on tv and stuff like that they're seeing all these different girls playing different sports who have different body shapes and sizes The Women's Sport Trust did um, a link up with Getty Images, it was quite a few years ago now, because they had done some research and found that if you went online and searched kind of female athletes, the images that came up on, say, Google, for example, were just uh, very narrow and that kind of only, only female athletes that looked in a certain way and, and there were barely any action pictures either. Um, and so they, they did a, a work with Getty Images and then just shot a load of different women different backgrounds, different sexualities, different colour skin and um, and had them all doing their sport in action, in motion and showing off their bodies all the range of what that looked like for various different sports and and, and, and I think it is important that we, and that's the good thing about social media, that, that there is now more access, more opportunity to, to watch, to see to follow um, to female athletes and in all of their different diverse um, body shapes yeah i think i remember that and i think that's what we need more of isn't it because actually like, i was always really conscious and always look back on like videos or like photos i was like oh my god like the cellular on my legs is disgusting but actually like that's that's me that's me as a prop who needs big thighs so but actually like yeah it's important for probably me to be true to myself there so that any aspiring props coming up can see well actually it doesn't matter um so yeah, probably need more stuff like that going on to show that actually female athletes across every single sport will have different bodies and that's absolutely okay. And you will find the sport that fits your body type or whatever. Well, I, um, I played at a Dutch club after Rio and as a fact as I kind of see, you know, goodbye, goodbye present, they gave me a picture and the manager changed the picture because um, one of the coaches had done it and he just picked any old picture. He didn't care. It was like an action picture. He's like, put it in. And the manager, this woman, sorry, she was like, well, Kate's not going to want that because uh, she's got a wobbly leg and like all my cellulite was like wobbling. It was like jelly. And, uh, and it was quite funny. And then like afterwards I was like, no, but that is my leg. Like, and that's where, what it was doing at that moment. But there's so much shame around, still around cellulite and stretch marks or, and, and, any, and anything, because we're all different. So it's what we feel, how we feel shame and what and why we feel that shame. And we're all different. It might be because in that picture, we're heavier than we'd like to be. It might be because we're, we're much thinner than we'd like to be. And it's, it's, it's we're so 
I don't know, I just feel like we're so bound by some kind of guidelines that we've set ourselves and it's, I don't know where, yeah. That's probably because people Photoshop cellulite out of, out of models who, mm. even like a size six model has blooming cellulite, yeah, it gets Photoshopped before it gets put out and then everyone thinks, ah, oh, that person hasn't got cellulite so I can't have cellulite. And actually every single woman does because unfortunately <laughs> it's genetics and we are more likely to have it than men. So, yeah. Mm embrace the cellulite you're listening to sportspiel the players podcast something you said there about you know cellulite it does only affect women but it also feels like when it comes to like choosing images and things like that, there's still so much more scrutiny around women than men. And it makes me think of like, when we, we think back to the whole, the cat suit um, thing with Serena Williams, when she was banned from wearing a cat suit because of how it looks, even though she wore it for, for blood clots or Elise Cornet, uh, the, the tennis player who was given a court violation for changing her top. When we see Nadal do that all the time and everyone praises him for it or Celine Van Gurn, she was a gymnast who wore this really like, fluorescent cat makeup all of a sudden then women female gymnasts were being told they could only wear modest makeup and in my former sport of cheerleading there were no rules for how guys could look like we could have beards like hair however we wanted but the girls you had to have like every everyone on your team had to have the same hairstyle everyone had to have the same makeup everybody had to have clean nails otherwise you get deducted points at certain competitions, not all of them, but do you feel like there's almost like double standards for, for women and that you're actually often being penalised for how you look, whereas in, uh, men, men wouldn't be? I don't but know. I always question, like, who is making those rules? Because is it a man or is it a woman? And I'm pretty sure that if a woman was to sit down and think, actually, like, if I was on the receiving end of that, would I like it? The answer is going to be no. So actually, like, I don't know, maybe that's me again being really judgmental and stereotypical now, but like uh, the people making the decisions, have they actually spoken to women about it? Probably not. Uh, yeah, I think that goes to what I was trying to say earlier, but I was pussy fussy fussy <laughs> around what I actually wanted to say was that 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 who has held power through centuries, men and white men in particular have held power and they have held power over everything and women's bodies is one of those things how, and how we view it is, and how we have to look to attract the attention of men. Like it's, it's all kind of, all of that stuff is, is, is all part of that, um, that women regaining some of that power and, and feeling like they have control over what the hair looks like for goodness sakes what makeup they wear but I still you know I still hear it now I hear it in, not just in sport I hear it in, in retail like if people in shops having to wear certain makeup having to wear certain clothes and it's like are we still in Victorian times like you can't force women to look a certain way or wear a certain thing I don't think I think yeah we need more empowerment of women it, it kind of comes back to like if you look at the amount of women on like boards of ngbs or whatever there isn't actually enough women that are influential enough to make to make those decisions and say well actually in cheerleading like what why why do men have can do what they want and women have to all have the same makeup or and like i just think if, if actually if, if that if there is more female influence at the top then it, it will trickle down but Again, we've got to fight to get our places on things like that, um, which is always going to be a challenge. And I know it's starting to change, but it's going to take years. Mm -hmm. Definitely starting to move on. And th this kind of perfectly segues into our second section, really, which is specifically about kit, um, which we've already talked about a little bit so far. And I know Limitless are obviously, you know, a huge promoter of that accessibility to all with regarding kit but but first off i'm gonna essentially steal a headline from an article that was written by sports journalist rebecca myers of the times and this was released back in may 2019 now but it's still quite apt and it referenced a lot of the examples will mentioned earlier about sports kit uh, as well as 
pinpointing kind of crop tops and short hemlines and what pea kit looks like when you're growing up in school at the same time so the list goes on really in terms of examples but I suppose the first question to ultimately ask is sports kit sexist? So for me I think Justo can even back me up on this point um even still to now in a lot of the clubs in um where we play rugby we're still receiving some boys kit so I know at England we've received these really quite long gym shorts for the ages now and they they really don't fit women so I always ask for like bigger sizes to actually just give to my brothers because I was like I'm not going to wear them they they don't they don't fit me um they're they're not girl shorts there's no point in me even receiving them um it's not only till this year actually that we have finally received girls gym shorts that fit hallelujah us. i know after I 10 years of that. asking <laughs> I only got them. praise better late than never comes to mind years, years of nagging to get these gym shorts to finally be girls gym shorts and i even know even at clubs um we are still receiving men's sizes and you've got some girls that are tiny tiny girls that are having to wear even a men's size small and that's just really baggy on them um so yeah for sports kit we're still receiving some men's kit because on, on that gym short point um before the last world cup we actually had to buy our own canterbury england shorts that we were actually going to wear because we were like we don't want these so then we had to go out of our pocket and buy shorts that we felt comfortable in and that were I don't I, I don't know if they were like women's fit but like they were shorter and fitted our body types more than some horrible baggy board shorts thing um and I also remember a time um so it was before we played Wales again I think it was probably that same season but I think it must have been like one of the first years that they'd actually had like women's like England playing kit and I think most of the tops were fine. But basically, like the day before, um, the day before we were playing, we would like normally go down to the team room and like pick up our socks and our like, sh like should we have shirt prez? And afterwards you pick up your socks and your shorts. And we all came down and there was like these women's fit short shorts, and there were like there was like 20 size smalls, 10 size mediums, three larges, and like one pair of XL. And so all the forwards came down and we were like, <laughs> literally like squeezing on these extra large women's shorts. Like I can't move in these. And there was one pair and like literally all eight of the starting pack, like probably needed like a five XL. And you know, when you're like, I appreciate the fact you're giving us women's sizes, but these just aren't representative of the size that we actually are. So what we had to do in the end was call the men's team who had like played their fixture the day before and borrow some of the men's shorts so that we could actually fit into them because there wasn't they we didn't fit them and you know when you're like oh my god like how is this happening like yeah. who ordered 20 pairs of size small shorts for a women's rugby team <laughs> but that happens all the time like zoe in like club rugby doesn't it you always like find like every all the shorts are just tiny and you're like yeah i remember last year at um, Saracens or the year before a load of kit came in and it was woman's size small but that was just fitting the, sm the really small girls um, and people like Hannah Bottomman a, a, a prop forward she could not fit in any of the kits and then we had to go out searching and find her bigger size we had to find her men's sizes because the woman's sizes did not go up to her size so it's either you have to be a tiny girl or you're in men's kit so yeah but that's yeah. again surely got to like stem the problem that like I'm, I'm a size 16 and I'm happy to admit that and I couldn't even fit into a 2xl pair of shorts so if you've got a young girl 15 years old who's a size 12 14 who's got to put on x double xl pair of shorts what's that going to do for their body image like yeah <laughs> yeah no everything yeah everything that you've said it, I can repeat it's 
you know, you, you get picked for the Olympics. I remember Sydney thinking, right, this is going to be the best kit we've ever had. It's going to be amazing. It's the Olympics, for God's sake. It's, like, it's got to be, like, fitting everybody really well. And it was, I just remember it was, it was unisex. Most of it was unisex. The kind of, all the track suits and all the other stuff was unisex. So it was basically small man size. And it's like, well, for some, for some women, okay, maybe you can get away with it, depending on your body shape. But for some and quite a lot of the women's team I remember just they were just having to roll everything over and roll it up at the bottom just feel like crap and you're supposed to be feeling like feeling great like you're there whether you're playing rugby playing hockey whatever you're representing your country you want to feel the very best because you're about to go and perform your very best and just all, all through the years having to deal with like sewing velcro on to bodysuits so that the skirts wouldn't ride up to here and they look ridiculous like it's just there's just so many things where women's bodies have not been thought of and again not been thought of in the in the what a range you know we had players in our team that were six foot we had players who were tiny like little size six really petite very small and we all need to wear the same kit but trying to do that was just impossible i've had shorts that were frankly obscene that I had to wear shorts underneath because they were just nobody needs to see that and they were then you know and just oh it's just awful massive baggy shirts and then to the other side other end of the spectrum where we were kind of getting our kit sorted for Rio and they were coming up with well can we have completely sheer sheer back and can we have a completely sheer front of the skirt and we were like no I mean no have you seen the positions we get into nobody no like that, what are we doing? We're playing hockey. Like we just want skirts and vests. That's all we want. But it's, it just seems to be so difficult. But it is the wrangle. I feel like it's that wrangle between we know what men's kit looks like. We know how to manufacture men's kit. And then there's like women, women's kit. Wow, we can really take this like really far. And it's just we need to just find some middle middle ground. The worst part is, is when you're trying you're trying to play your best, and then the you're too worried about how your kit's fitting. Um, I know at Saracens last year, there's some, it's a funny thing throughout the team, but it's got to a point where we're like, no, this needs changing. Um, if you look back and we're analysing our games, you literally see girls, right, so someone's made a break and you see a girl right behind her, but having to pull down her shirt the whole time because it's a men's size kit. So the shoulders are really big and puffy on, ours, on us. The arms are huge, but the shirt comes really in um, at like the waist around the tummy. So they're too tight for us. So they just continuously, continually roll up and like we're all running there and pulling down our tops constantly. And you just see loads of photos of us after the game and half the people's bellies are out. And it's like, this looks like a crop top on us. It's just boy sizes again that are fit to a boy's athletic shape that just do not fit us. Does it feel, still feel like an afterthought? Because even if we look at this last week and the Matildas of the Australian women's football team released their new kits and Nike forgot to release the away kit in a women's cut and it's going to take them a year to sort it. And like we, we mention so often about the, the progression of women's sport and how much more promotion it's getting and how that's a great thing. Yet those, there's still so many examples of that happening weekly if not daily for us over the past month i think just was about to say it as well um ireland their new kit for this season was just yeah. um, they used boys um the boy rugby players as their male models and they used random woman models as their to wear the woman's kit and they have so many girls that they could have picked from in the irish team and they just choose chose not to use them and I think that completely blew up over Twitter and um, I think a lot of people saw it and I think Ireland did get a lot of grief for that. We actually had um, Rona Lloyd and, and Sarah Bonner on, on our previous episode to talk about that and the, the I am enough movement but that also yeah that, that did lead to a change in, in policy in Canterbury that the manufacturer came out and, and said they'd make changes but I guess, does that frustrate you as athletes that it takes something like that to happen and to blow up in the faces of the company for change to happen? Do you, you much rather, I guess, prefer it to just be happening in, in the first instance so these incidents don't happen? 
Yeah, and I literally don't get how it's so hard. Like, why? How is it that difficult? Like, you're using three male players, so use three female players. And I, I think, um, I, I, Zoe, this might have been before your time, but there was a point where they kept, not necessarily with kit launches and stuff, they've always been pretty good with, with kit launches, Canterbury with England. Um, not like, they would normally be like the token girl, but it, we're there, so that's something. Um, but there was points where like um, there's like an inner warrior campaign which is about getting females into rugby and they kept using these like random people and we were literally like who are these people and why are you using them and we had to like raise it in a meeting and be like can you not use us like are we not good enough role models to get people to play rugby and you know when you're like you just sit there like, it literally baffles me like what is going through these people's heads when they make those decisions like it's when just... you've got role models there <laughs> Uh, this um, week, actually, Poppy Cleals put on her Instagram that she's looked through the Pro Direct um, Instagram, rugby Instagram, and it's just all men. There is no post on that Instagram account of women or any of us rugby players. And um, there's even the latest posts have been of the Umbro launch of the New England kit. And the women were there. Umbro have released all the pictures of the women that were there. Um, so she brought up the fact that why aren't you posting any of us and they came back quite negatively and she then had to go through other um accounts like nike and adidas and show them that there's this um percentage of women being shown on their account um and it was just really negative from pro direct and it's just a bit weird that we're really still an art afterthought on a brand like that um yeah just really bad i think yeah it's it's the same it's the same across the board it's the same for every you know if, if a woman person of color people with disabilities like it, it we need when we, now i think people are speaking up and are saying things i think that's that's again one of the positive things about social media is you can respond and you can say something back it feels a little bit easier to speak up and i think people are doing it but it you know I, it just it just got tired. I just got tired of just being the angry woman all the time and saying, "Can we have this, the equal um, equal representation for the women? Can we make sure that's the same for the women?" And just you know, you just it's just constant, and you either just have to just suck it up and get on with it, or um, or just let it go. And if you let it go, then it's going to just keep on happening for years to come. So it's yeah, I, th I think it's it's upon. It's upon us now to make sure that we keep calling it out and keep challenging it when you see it. Otherwise, you know, it's it's really on us if we don't do anything about it. Does, does the overall message from these promotional campaigns also need adjusting? Because I think back to, I want to say this was 2014 around then, but the awful campaign the Football Association did, which was a Disney princess campaign, mm -hmm. you know, get women into football. By, by basically portraying them as princesses and then again this is this last month where I think the US soccer um or the manufacturers produced a bunch of soccer princess hoodies and things like that to try and get women into the game and whether that message needs to change as well in that you can you can only be a princess to play that sport see I think that's fine if if they show if they have other versions of what it feel is to be a, a a US soccer player or a female athlete, you know, if it if it is also warrior, um, I don't know what, you know, superhero and princess, that's fine. Because then because then that will appeal to all the different kinds of girls that like princesses or like superheroes or whatever. But if it's only one thing, then that's that's the that's the wrong way to go in my opinion because what are you saying about women who don't who do play sport and don't fit that mold what are you saying that's you feel then quite negative if you don't you know if you don't want to be a disney princess yeah that wouldn't have appealed to me not gonna lie <laughs> i feel like it's like that kind of whole thing where like you've got boys and girls toys and, and the girls are all of the pink fluffy things and the boys just <laughs> but, like that comes down to that doesn't it like Again, it's assuming that because you're a girl, you like a Disney princess. But what if I don't? Is that then not the sport for me? So yeah, I think, and I guess it's whether they've actually done any market research or any 
any research at all to say that that would actually have any influence on people joining the sport mm -hmm. so yeah I mean it depends what type of approach they were trying to go for because is it them trying to show that um girly girls can play sport maybe um but then again you've got I was in a girly girl when I was younger I tried to go to ballet and I couldn't so it's just <laughs> depends what approach they're trying to take I yeah I don't really understand that one yeah definitely um we kind of wanted to touch on the technical aspect of the kit as well in terms of conversation one example being uh the IDA sport is the name of the company this is a couple of years ago where they crowdfunded for a mission to design a football boot for women because it had been forever basically that women had been using small men's boots or children's boots i think they found that 75 percent of women playing grassroots football were using those two options and there were links between the use of those football boots um, by women and that was perhaps a reason why they were getting so many acl injuries because the boot obviously didn't match their running style or their body shape whatever it might be is, is that something that we sorely need to research more and perhaps develop even further because i suppose you look at potential injuries that might have been caused by poor kit and you're also losing a large fraction of your career for that as well that sort of goes back to the the whole kit thing it's assuming that girls all are the same um but we're not you've got to really look into it and you know really look at your sizes like the men it's a small medium large but we've got to go up in our 10 12s 14s 16s uh, so it's it's putting a bit more research and stuff like that to not just releasing a boot and thinking oh we're involving the girls it's actually having a lot more research behind it before they do it there's a brilliant book by caroline credo perez called invisible women and she talks about the data gap in research um in anything, in everything and anything, basically, there's a data gap. So like seat belts, how they're designed, they're not designed to fit a woman's body. Even that I saw a recent tweet about PPE stuff that's it's been made to fit a generic body and that generic body is a male body. Um, and we're still, we're still there. We need way more research in, in every aspect of, of, of manufacturing, of um, product design, of everything so that it does fit that broad body type that is now playing sport. It would, you know, this is 20, 20, like, come on, like it's women are playing sport and playing sport for a long time. We're doing it really well, same as the men. So let's make sure that everybody has kit and equipment that is right for them and their body. I was just gonna add there, as long as the women's boots don't turn up just in pink with love hearts on or something, just <laughs> that. That does my head in. <laughs> yeah. I've often gone for the for the men's um Astros, um, the hockey shoes because the the, the girls, the, the women's ones they bring out are like pastel, which not you know, I don't hate pastel and some people love pastel, that's fine. But I want this, you know, I just want a nice shoe. I don't colours don't aren't gendered. We let's stop doing that. Um and just yeah, design good stuff. A broad range of it. Sticking with, with yourself here, Kate, because I know that in, in hockey at certain times in, when you're defending short corners and, and when you have the shin pads and everything, you, you wear a lot more protective gear than quite a lot of rugby players do. And I, I read a piece uh, with a, an American footballer who plays for Great Britain called Phoebe Schechter, who says she plays using men's protection and says mm. that actually it doesn't fit her properly and it puts her at greater risk of injury. Is that something that you found in, in hockey? I don't quite know, like if how how big the differences need to be but you find that you know quite often the, the 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 actual protective equipment you're given only fits men and that actually puts you at a really a great danger of serious injury yeah do you know what it's one of those things that you just kind of you get on with and you don't really think about it but when somebody mentions it you're like yeah actually the shin guards do like i probably was okay because i was maybe on the on the bigger size of the, of the range of the female athletes that were playing, I was playing with the players. But for some of the girls, like their, the shin pads would like come like over their knee, which is not really great when you're bending and trying to sprint. And, um, and definitely certain sort of mask size and things like that, just hand guards, all that stuff. It, it just, again, is I think the generic body shape is unisex and unisex means male. 
And so it is definitely, it is definitely a risk. If the masks are moving around, if you get hit by a ball on the side of your head, traveling at 100 kilometers an hour, there's very serious ramifications. And therefore we need kit that fits us properly. Otherwise, you know, bad things are gonna happen. So we, manufacturers do need to do more. Um, and players probably themselves, probably we do need to challenge more. We, we do need to speak up and, and say more. Is there still also examples where perhaps society and again social media probably plays a part in this as well where kit can be sexualized i suppose looking at certain sports like track and field for example because i think yasmin sawyers has said something similar and that's predominantly why she um competes in a in an all-in-one what what when we talk around this kind of sexualized stuff what i always kind of think of is the beach volleyball players yeah, like prancing around in like a crop top and pants. And I'm like, what is the need for that? And but again, it's probably just like a cultural thing and cultural sexualization of that sport. Um, but but again, like whenever I watch athletics, I'm like, what? Why was you running in a bikini? Like, surely that is not comfortable. <laughs> like, so. But again, just it's just that's how it always is, and I guess that is sexualizing people because there is literally no need for that. You bec you could be a lot more streamlined if you wore a full body suit. Yeah. So is that the reason why it is like that? From like cultural, in being embedded in a culture for so long. Don't yeah, know. I do remember I asked um, Jess Breach, one of the wingers at rugby. She used to uh, was a hurdler, and I uh, I did ask her. I was like, oh, do you wear the all like pant looking type things when you used to do uh hurdling she went no they're really uncomfortable i used to wear like the um the sort of short shorts that some of us actually wear under our shorts for rugby um and i was like oh so why I, they just look really uncomfortable to me i think you'd actually just chafe the whole time i there is as just said i just think that there is no need for it especially with the the beach volleyball as, as well I think I'm mentally scarred from year seven athletics uh, meet and our PE teacher said that the girls had to run in their PE knickers, which was not okay on any level. No. Um, I'm so scarred by that episode. Um, but no, I think it's again, it's just about that. It's just making sure that there, there is choice in that for those, because often all those, athletes, particularly track and field, I think probably is maybe one of the, the most prevalent but I think you know they're sponsored so do their sponsors produce a number of different options so yeah here if you want to wear a two-piece you know knickers and bra fine if you want to wear all-in-one lycra here's that do they or is it like this is what you've got to wear and this is what you have to wear um because then it's different because then I think again is who's making those decisions and who has the power of those women's bodies um so I think that's that's the difference for me um, I don't feel like, I feel like maybe how the media covered some of the kind of um, advancements in female in hockey kits. So like I remember the hockey rules, I think, were the first team to wear um, bodysuits, tight like a bodysuits um, back in 2000. And that was like a real re revelation because we'd all been wearing men's baggy polo shirts and skirts um, before that. And um, And I think probably just how it was covered, it was, you know, it's tight, it's lycra, it's like, and it's just like, well, no, they feel that that's going to make them perform better, um, run harder for longer, with less weight to carry at the end of the game because it's light material, you're not carrying all the water, and, you know, and it just, it's just, again, it's not even just how the kit we're wearing, it's how it's portrayed by the media as well. It's an interesting point you made there, and it's something I sort of thought of in my notes because when the media talk about athletes a lot of the time they use a lot of quite strong adjectives and things like that and and i specifically remember kate when you um had your you broke your jaw in london 2012 and the use of the terms like warrior and, and things like that and they say a lot about rugby players how brave and strong and powerful you are is it almost you would actually rather them not sort of be commenting on on how you look and using those things at all or i don't know what sort of the the balancing act, I guess, that you, you think would be would be best when the media are, are sort of covering these sorts of things. 
mean, just talk about the performance. Yeah. Just talk yeah. about how we're playing. Talk about the skill that we've shown, the the quality of our teamwork, the you know, the, our fitness. Like, talk about that. I think I always ask the question: Would you would you say that about a male athlete? Would you say that about a men's team? Would you say that about the men's equivalent? And I think if we keep asking that question and you be honest with that answer, then I think more we'll work will turn out okay. It's the brave bit that gets me is that why am I brave for doing a sport that I enjoy playing? Yeah. Like, because it's a contact sport doesn't mean I'm brave. I, I enjoy doing that. So for me, I don't, it's as Kate just said, it's what, why aren't you saying about our performance and like our skill level? Not that we're brave for, you know, getting a contact injury or something. That's, that's what I enjoy. That's what I do. I know I'm going to get injured. It doesn't make me brave. <laughs>Last thing on kit as well, and specifically with PE kit, I don't think I was really expecting an example like Kate has just given, but that's going to stick in the mind. <laughs> but it ultimately sums up, I suppose, what the overall argument is with PE kit and how inadequate it is really. And do we feel that is a large reason as to why so many young girls switch off from sport and never come back? I definitely think it's one of the major reasons. I just got so much better, by the way. Like I go into schools now and the girls, some of them got leggings on, sweat, sweatshirts. I was literally in like a, a really tiny skirt and a polo shirt. That was my PE kit. And in the middle of winter, like awful. Who wants to wear that? And, you know, having to bend over playing sports that require you to do that and worrying about what people can see and, who's walking past the, you know, it's, it's, you just don't want to be thinking about any of that. You just want to be thinking about having fun playing sport, not like pulling things down and shoving them up and do, just play. And so I just think it's give them choices, give them options, let them look like what they want to look like, not what people think they, what people want them to look like. I remember, uh, for me, it was completely different. I, um, Ours was a polo top and shorts, and they were a really long, quite long shorts. I remember I ended up having my brother's kit because it was exactly the same for the boys and girls, so I just took my brother's kit. Um, and I actually remember it being so cold and we weren't allowed to wear any sort of leggings or anything like that. Or I remember I had to take my brother's hoodie from when he'd been on a tour because as long as it had the school badge on it, you could wear it, so I ended up wearing his kit. But I also remember that when the girls would play hockey, they all bought their uh, scores from the teams that they played from, from out of mm. school, because they didn't want to, they weren't going to wear those baggy, like basketball type shorts. They, they all wanted to wear their scores. Um, so yeah, I think it was, as you say, like a unisex kit, but it was a, basically for the male average body. I was, I probably, um bit closer to Kate's age I think so I again had the um nice knickers and we and our color was red so we had like these red knickers and this horrible like pleated skirt yes and it was yeah and if you then forgot your skirt you just had to go in your knickers when everyone else was in their skirt and I remember as well like or if you forgot it you could go through the lost property and pick out a skirt and for me there was never anything that fit in there and then so then I ended up in my blooming pants and I was like, this is awful. And then and then we did bring in having oh my, sorry, the dogs like just bang the bike. Um <laughs> and then they brought in that we we're allowed to wear like shorts in like year nine or whatever. But they were those like horrible, may as well have been like see-through reds, like you know when they've got like light like lines down them. I don't even know what material they are. And they were just awful. And I hated my legs anyway. And I would have just felt much comfortable in something else. But yeah, like, yeah. No. Like the fo football three pound shorts from Sports Direct. Yes, literally those. But you had to go to the, like, the same shop that everyone had to go to and they cost like 20 quid each or something. Exactly. Really. 
the town shop where you yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that pretty much doesn't it uh, it's got fun. to be, sorry, just to add, it's got to be affordable. It's got to be affordable as well. It does have to be, it can't be like, you've got to go and get this high-end gear. I mean, which is what Limitless Hombres are trying to do. It's not just about the first team or the second team. It's about everybody being able to play sport. And so I think that we also need to really, really think hard about that. Sport is great. It can be great. But we need to make sure it is an opportunity to be great for everybody and that the cost has got to come into it. Okay. Yeah, which is, which is a really good point, actually. Um, there's the affordability across the board for sport. You want everyone to be involved and it's got to be accessible to everyone. Mm. The, the final bit then, just to round off this podcast episode, and we want to finish a bit more on a positive and predominantly think about how you can actually build a positive body image of yourself. So for each of you, is there anything you've specifically found or worked out along your own journeys that has helped you build up that more positive body image you have with yourself? For me, it goes back to what I said at the start of, it was that one person, that one SNC coach that had to turn around to me and say about Jessica Ennis and how far she's got for, from the body she's created. It's don't be scared um, to put on any weight or um, lift some weights because you're doing it for your sport. And if you want to go to a World Cup or the Olympics, you're going to need to lift, lift some weight. Um, and don't worry about what anyone else has to say about it, because if you're going to end up um, on the Olympic stage or the World Cup stage, then you, know, you, you will have forgotten about what that, that one person has said to you that's negative, because you'll be at the top of your game um, and living your dream but it's just focusing on what you need to do and not worrying what other people have to think. Um, I think for me, it would be a bit similar, but just like being proud, being proud of, of, of what your body is and what it can do, whatever that means for you. Um, I, I was really muscly. I didn't, I never thought a thing about my muscle physique. I really loved it and I worked hard at it. Um, but I remember when I cut my hair really short and I had a, like a pixie crop and, and someone took a picture of me in Argentina and I was like really like fired up and I was, all my muscles were bulging, like veins were popping out and, and that picture like really, I struggled with it for a while and I used it, but then I used it purposefully and talked to my to schools because I wanted to show girls a different image than probably the ones they were seeing day to day in a female athlete and one headmaster said to me after one speech said, couldn't you have used a prettier picture? Which, which just said it all to me. And the influence that he was having on the, the girls in his school, you know, at, and I just said it in front of the girl, I just said, look, I'm really proud of what I look like there. That's me at my very best, having worked hard for that body. I'm representing my country. So whatever your body does and whatever it looks like, be proud because it's serving you well. Yeah, again, along the same lines, it's, it's accepting that actually we might be a bit more muscly, but actually that's why we're good at our sport. And actually, like Kate just said, we work blooming hard to get that physique, which a lot of people actually envy. Um, I think, like I said at the start as well, uh, I'm probably proud of my body now because I've, I've started doing like a kind of crossfit -y kind of stuff and I absolutely love it and I'm actually doing like a nutrition plan at the minute to try and get as lean as I can because actually throughout my rugby career I was always trying to put on weight and stuff and now I'm like oh let's see how lean I can get maybe I'll have a six pack one day um so yeah I think um yeah and, and actually like if people comment like oh you're like you're quite muscly I'm like yeah yeah I am and I work blooming hard for that and it's just being proud of it and actually yeah I love it and and people should love their bodies and especially if you put lots of hard work into it and and dedicate time in the gym and happy days i feel good for it and i know we've talked a lot about ne negative examples and, and things not being the way they should be but do you think that that things are changing for women do you think that things are becoming a, a bit more accepted uh, and and that uh, you're being celebrated for how you look or do you still think we've got a long way to go I'd say we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I think getting us out there and showing all these um, 
young girls that want to play sport that they can be any body type is amazing um just going through all the team sports you now see like hockey cricket rugby football all of us all of our different sports being put on tv is fantastic but at, like as we say a month ago irish rugby put up the models and they didn't use the role models they had on the irish team just shows us how far we still have to go yeah De definitely definitely agree i think we have come so far but we still have a long way to go and i think again just making sure that we we just keep broadening the view that it is not now it doesn't just become white middle class women's bodies we're looking at it's it's also people of color people with disabilities just making sure that it is 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 a total broad range of of people and what they look like playing sport yeah, and I think, Kate, like you said before, actually, it's down to us guys to actually push that forward and and ad advocate that um, and as part of being role models for our sports, push that forward because, yeah, we could easily just let it go by and then 10 years down the line, nothing's changed. But, yeah, we've got to keep pushing it forward. And obviously, and I know in the rugby world, we've, we've got a lot of people that are really passionate about that. And, and again, I'm passionate about equality and everything like that. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but yeah, you've got to see it to be it, haven't you? So. It's a perfect line for this. Um, and I know we've also talked about sort of the negativity that social media can have, but actually the positive impact social media can have for stuff like this. Do you almost have that extra sense of responsibility on yourselves as role models to help try and put that out there where you can? Which I suppose can be daunting in some ways when you're opening yourself up to the public eye so much. Yeah, I mean, I try, I, when I was going to the gym, I'm not going at the moment because I don't want, really want to go, but I would, I would, would purposefully forcing myself to take pictures of what I actually look like having finished the session. Actually, no filters, no me posing, no sorting my face out, just take a picture because it's real. And if I was a young girl, I'd want to see real. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have to try and aspire to be something that's, that's totally fake and falsified and photoshopped because it's impossible. I like to use um, my sort of a platform to show, um, so there's action shots in rugby, so when I'm picking, you can see this muscle um, coming, like my quad muscle, um, and show girls that side that, you know, you need to be muscly for your sport, but also the other side of it, when I'm going out with friends and socialising, that you can get all girly up, you know, makeup, uh, dresses, and all that sort of stuff but it's showing the different side and as a girl you can have different sides you can have that muscly part but you can also have that really pretty girly side and show how you are um yeah and i think that's something that i try like if i go into schools or whatever and do talks like i always say like actually it was rugby that kind of allowed me to find who i was and i always felt like i was the big odd one out and and that allowed me to use that in a really positive way and I normally get quite a few questions about that and and kind of girls coming up to me after and being like oh, I feel a bit like that and I'm like go find your sport then girl you got this um so yeah um yeah definitely kind of important to mention along the way somewhere and and yeah even if it's just one girl that goes on and kind of feels more accepted for who she is then then that's our job done really and then I suppose our last question for this and kind of along those lines, Justine, if anyone else who might be listening to this or seeing clips of this are in a position where they are struggling, and I think sport probably has a large part to play there in finding your home, what advice would you give to that person who might be facing that struggle right now? I think I'd say you're not alone. There'll be many, many people going through, if not the same, something similar. And there's some brilliant um, people that you can just reach out to and speak to and they'll be more than willing to, to listen and be heard without judgment and no shame. So I think be, be bold and try and speak to somebody if you can. As Kate said, I'd say you're not like if it's like a girl that um, feels bigger than the other girls in our class, if you went to even another class in that school or another year group or even another school, there will be girls just like you um, use it to your ability though and as Jessica says go find your sport and use what you have to go further with it. 
Yeah, just echo all these points. And I think what Kate just said there is really important. Obviously, mental health is such a massive thing in this day and age. And and if you are struggling, there's definitely help out there. So, so you know, be, be brave. Admitting that you're struggling is the hardest part. Um, but there's lots of amazing, amazing support out there. So if, if, it, if it is kind of hurting you, please do reach out and, and kind of speak to teachers, parents, friends, whoever, to try and get that support. And with that then, I say that's almost a pretty much perfect way to end, isn't it? Because like you say, I think in the coronavirus world, it can be very easy for people to feel isolated right now. And it emphasises the importance, doesn't it, of reaching out and speaking out to people and finding something to focus on at the same time. So thank you everyone for being a part of this podcast. Like I say, it's been incredibly honest um, from pea kit stories to boiled eggs. Um, and quite frankly, it's, 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 it's a discussion that a lot of people need to have more regularly, isn't it? Whether it's on social media or in boardrooms or anything like that. So big thanks to Zoe, to Justine and to Kate for joining us on the podcast today. Also Alex Wallace of the Mintridge Foundation who has been listening to this in the background. Uh, thank you to her for organising this and also to Limitless of course um, because Mintridge and Limitless are obviously two organisations that we've shouted about constantly for a good number of years now about what they're doing to create positive change on that front particularly for younger people in schools and the work that everyone does in these schools is so so important for people going forward that's it then from myself that's it from will and um, do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and of course you can find all of our uh, bits and bobs on social media our handles at sports bill pod on all of them but until next time everyone stay safe and we'll see you very soon Thank you.